I don't know. I really didn't want to become a Japanese. I wish I had been born as a Western. I really, really wanted to. Why? Why am I Japanese? Japan is just a small island in the Pacific Ocean. Country of closed door policy. And also, very boring culture. And wearing kimono is so tiring. <laughs> <laughs> very uncomfortable. I don't know why. I have no interest in Japanese culture. <laughs> Hopeless. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. I am Lily Noriko. I am an English and Japanese interpreter based in Sendai City in Japan. I was born and raised here in Sendai City. There is a certain reason why I became an interpreter. The reason and background was very simple. When I was 10 years old, I was just relaxing at home and watching TV, and I found a very cool interpreter on TV. She was just in between the Japanese guy and also Western guy. But at the age of 10, I had no idea what she was doing. I, had, I didn't know the occupation as interpreter at the time. But when I was watching what she was doing, I understood, oh, OK, this is what is called interpreter or translator. Wow, that's cool. And I wonder how it would be possible having two or three languages at the same time and then translating one language to the other and vice versa. Wow, I saw she was like a musician or mystery. <laughs> and that was the reason why I decided to become an interpreter. And then I also wondered the, what kind of mechanism she had in her brain. What was happening? Why simultaneous interpreting is possible? So I thought, OK, then I just have the interpreter just in from myself and then cut the head when, once she was doing the simultaneous interpreting and show the mechanism. But <laughs> no, 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 no. Of course, it's impossible. So at the age of 10, I thought the only possible way to understand the mechanism of the interpreter was to become an interpreter. So my reason is quite simple, isn't it? But of course, it took so long until I became a professional interpreter. There are many hardships and challenges, of course. The first challenge was at the age of 10, because I got very interested in English. And then I got very interested in Western culture. But I was born and raised in a single parent family, very poor. And I asked my mom, Mom, I want to study English. And she said, why, Noriko, why do you want to study English, by the way? <laughs> and I said, oh, because I want to become an interpreter. And her reaction was hopeless. Of course not. You have no talent. You are stupid. You are one of the worst, poorest students in class. Your score at school is very poor. How is it possible? And no one in your family, relatives, speak English. No, no, no. It's impossible. But if you really want to have a will, have a will. Just wait I do, until junior high school, and you're going to study English for free. OK? So I was waiting. So when I received the first textbook at junior high school in English, I got so, so excited. And then I tried to memorize everything, turn the page over and over again, and then wrote all the English sentences and translate them into Japanese over and over again. And listen to the radio and copy what the native speaker was saying. And second challenge was, when I was at high school, my mom said, no, you can't go to university because, you know, my family is poor. So after high school, you have the responsibility to take care of the family, send money, that's it. So we had a big argument. And then while one of the teachers at high school saw my family's situation and just called me to the teacher's room and said, OK, um, so I hear that you have a, quite a big argument with your family. And then, OK, the solution is simple. If you don't have money, give up going to university. That's it. I couldn't believe his words, of course. But nothing never, ever stopped 
my motivation, because this is my life. I create my own life. And the third challenge was, um, uh, so I decided to go to the night school university, and I had a full-time job to pay for my tuition for the four years. But when I was about to graduate from the university, I realized that it's impossible to make my living just as an interpreter. So um, I became the high school teacher of English. And then I quit my job after six years, and then applied for a job position, interpreter's position. But I was rejected by three companies because I have no experience studying abroad or living abroad and lack of social experience. But I tried to do a lot of things and experience temporary jobs and finally found a very good position as an in-house translator. But as you know, in 2009, there was a quite serious economic crisis and then the wave also came over to Japan, and I was fired, lost my job. So that's why I decided to launch my own business, simple again. But the situation changed so much. In 2011, as you know, the Great East Japan earthquake on March 11th at the time, and many journalists, news reporters came to my city and then they are looking for local interpreters to work with them. And then I saw a lot of people in sadness, tragedy. People just stood, silence, can't do anything. And also, some people came, to, came up to the school gym only to find their family members, dead body. And I was interpreting their words, and I, wonder how I could do my best not to hurt their feelings. But at the same time, I felt this is my home. This is my country. I really wanted to be helped as an interpreter. That's my mission. And then my will became even stronger at the time. And after that, I had a um, lot of amazing experiences without any chance to study or live abroad. For example, here I work for um, former U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Ms. Caroline Kennedy. Wow. And the, um, Mr. Evgeny Poroshenko from Russia, the figure skater, the gold medalist. Wow, he's really cool, by the way. <laughs> but at the same time, working with so many people from the world, probably more than 50 countries, I started wondering who I am, where I belong to, where I come from. Probably I started feeling kind of identity crisis at the time. So at the time, I started looking at my own culture because meeting all those people from the world, I realized they love my country so much. Oh, Japan is such a beautiful country. I love you, they say. And then I had missed so much about my own culture, the beauty. And when I was feeling like that, I had an opportunity to become this princess by accident. There was, um, the po <laughs> they were like a Japanese traditional culture team looking for uh, like a someone who can act this one. I have never experienced that. Never worn kimono at the time, but when I was, uh, asked about this, I saw, sounds like fun. Why not? I'm free on the day. Okay. So I just did this for the local festival. But after that, we received a lot of opportunities to do that. Not only in Japan, but also in Taiwan, Thailand, and also in many other places. And then every time, people love us so much. Oh, when they see me, Japan, kimono, how beautiful you are. And then they always came out to me making a long queue and then taking pictures with me. Wow, everywhere. I realized, wow, my country, my culture is so much loved by everybody in the world. So I can become an open door to everybody in the world to show the beauty of my country. So now 
I believe that being globally active doesn't mean that I should lose or ignore my own culture as a Japanese. And I started to see my identity as a Japanese, cult a Japanese person more clearly. And by seeing other cultures from interpreters' eyes from many countries, many people, I came to understand how beautiful my country is and how proud I am as a Japanese. When learning another language, we might get stuck in between those few languages, probably. But stigma determines your identity in a way. And the point is that how to balance identity. I see my identity in global community. Keeping your own identity, identity but coexisting with the local identity. So let's not be afraid of following your dream, but keeping your own identity. Breaking stigma. You don't have to be fitted. You can be different. You choose to become whoever you are. Global mind, local heart makes myself more committed and devoted to serve as a strong interpreter even more. Now I am the open door to connect Japanese people and the world. Before becoming interpreter, the doors were closed, but I never gave up and will not give up for the rest of my life. Rather than opening doors, I break the doors. And each of us become a door or gateway to make miracles happen. So as I said earlier, there was a mystery as an interpreter. Now, working as a simultaneous interpreter for almost six years, I don't know yet what the mechanism is. It's still a mystery in my brain. I don't know what's happening. Why is it possible? But I determined to pursue my mission because I don't know yet. I can continue. I can enjoy doing that until I become 80, 90, 100 years old. While my local heart is being beating so strongly. Global mind, local heart. Thank you so much.